uh, I'm very appreciative of uh, the effort you put in in trying to follow and listen to something as densely written as what I presented you, um, especially since it is in many ways new, and that's not something that's easily assimilated um, quickly. So I am grateful for your efforts and for the fact that you're back. It uh, means a lot to me. The title of this lecture is The Processions Contain the Missions, Reconstructing the Doctrine of an Imminent Trinity. To speak of a resurgence of interest in the doctrine of the Trinity today is a drastic understatement. Not only is that doctrine now central to the thinking of a good many theologians, it is in a very real sense the only doctrine, and this for many reasons. First, since the Oxford movement changed the face of Anglicanism in the 19th century, the only creedal statement still honored in practice by the majority belonging to that communion has been the Nicene Creed. In fact, a fair number of Anglicans would say that the Nicene Creed alone is truly a creed. Even the authoritative teachings of the Council of Chalcedon are not to be regarded in this way since they are not recited liturgically in the churches. And so the authoritative teachings of Chalcedon are better regarded as a definition, not a creed. Second, the emergence of the evangelical Catholic movement within the Protestant churches has focused the attention of the ecumen ecumenically minded upon the teachings of the pre-Reformation church, those teachings held in common by the largest number of Christians scattered throughout the world today. Proponents of evangelical Catholicism understand themselves, pretty much, as belonging to a renewal movement within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Within their own denominations, this translates into a call for changes in theology, worship practices, catechesis, and mission. I tend myself to think of the theologies of this particular movement as Catholicism light. Roman Catholics, after all, are committed to all of the magisterial teachings of their church, not just a select number of them. Papal infallibility, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, her bodily assumption into heaven, and so much more are authoritative teachings. I suspect that a fair number of evangelical Catholics would not want to sign on to the whole list. If they did, they would probably convert. So it's a stripped down form of Catholic teaching which they represent. My Dominican friends watch these developments with bemused detachment. Not that they would mind over much if Protestantism were simply to implode, but they are not ready to grant the Catholicity of a fair bit of what claims that honorific for itself today. But third, the doctrine of the Trinity has become the only doctrine because defined carefully it can be shown, at least for those who defend this position, to contain in itself all other doctrines of importance. Other doctrines find their organic root in the doctrine of the Trinity, they are rightly ordered to it. It is worth noting, too, that the belief that theology finds its ground in the triune life of God and its center in the doctrine of the Trinity means that most of the theology done by evangelical Catholics is top-down, so to speak. It disdains a starting point in the so-called divine economy, preferring instead to begin from above with the imminent Trinity. Though he would not Though he probably would not even now describe himself as evangelical Catholic, John Webster shares this conviction with those belonging to that movement. I quote Webster, particularly in considering creation, it is important that the order of dogmatic exposition respect the material order of Christian teaching about the Trinity in relation to creatures. First the divine essence, then the distinction of persons, and only then the procession of creatures from God. Instinctively, he says, our minds are apt to run in a countervailing direction, preferring to begin instead with God's external works, perhaps because we are persuaded that scripture itself directs us to the historical phenomenological order of the divine acts towards the world. Progress with each point of the doctrine of the Trinity requires us to resist habit, no more so the habitual assumption that to begin from talk of God's life in himself is to obscure rather than to illuminate the divine economy, unquote. There lies hidden in this commitment to think out of a center in the imminent trinity a view of the relation of scripture tradition 
which I, as a Protestant theologian, cannot embrace. For the only knockdown argument I can think of for having to begin from above with the imminent trinity rather than the economy is that a version of it was declared to be orthodox at Constantinople in 381 and thus made to be authoritative. Holy Scripture, on the other hand, as I said the other day, sets forth no doctrine of the imminent trinity. To insist, therefore, upon, a, upon starting with the orthodox model is to place tradition on a level of authority equal to that of, of Scripture, if not surpassing it. One can then, of course, supplement this knockdown argument with all sorts of other considerations which will be persuasive to many. For example, the argument of the aesthetically inclined, that the god of classical Christian metaphysics is beautiful, or the argument that beginning with the imminent trinity effectively overcomes the tendency to collapse the imminent trinity into the economic trinity, and thereby preserves an appreciation for the ultimate ineffability of divine being and contributes directly to a robust and healthy Christian spirituality. But whether in these forms or in others, the rush to be Nicene contains within itself the seeds of the dissolution of the Protestant principle, sola scriptura. For the New Testament writers did not theologize from above. They begin with that which they have seen with their own eyes and handled with their own hands. And it is that which they declare. John Calvin, to his everlasting credit, was quite reticent to get caught up in the drive to be Nicene. When challenged in 1539 to defend his own orthodoxy by Pierre Caroli, where the doctrine of the Trinity was concerned, Calvin's initial response was refusal. Under pressure, he gradually gave in, grudgingly, but also made it clear that it had become necessary to make use of terms like homoousios only because the Arians had first troubled the church with their rejection of the equality of the Son with the Father. The same, he said, is true of the use of the word persons, which safeguards the differentiation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in confrontation with Sabellianism. But, he added, and I quote, if therefore the terms were not rashly invented, we ought to beware lest by repudiating them we be accused of overweening rashness. Indeed, I could wish they were buried if only among all men this faith were agreed on, that Father and Son and Spirit are one God, yet the Son is not the Father nor the Spirit the Son, but that they are differentiated by a peculiar quality." Unquote. And as for the authority of councils, Calvin wrote, and I quote, whenever the decree of any council is brought forward, I should like men first of all to diligently ponder at what time it was held, on what issue, and with what intention. What sort of men were present? Then to examine by the standard of scripture what it dealt with, and to do this in such a way that the definition of this council may have its weight and be like a provisional judgment, yet not hinder the examination that I have just mentioned." Unquote. It is in the spirit of Calvin of this statement that I will now seek to reconstruct the doctrine of the imminent trinity. I will seek everywhere to honor the values which came to expression in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed but I will be governed throughout by the New Testament teaching treated in my fourth lecture and the Christology which I sought to construct on the basis of that teaching in my fifth lecture. I'm going to begin with that basic model of the imminent trinity which I believe to be most in line with the Christology I outlined in my last lecture. It's the model set forth by Karl Barth in Church Dogmatics 1.1. Since I have no changes to suggest to its basic contours, I wish in the first section of this lecture only to defend them. But the model in question is treated by Bart at a relatively formal level of analysis. It's not yet materially elaborated in a full way. When subsequently Bart revised his doctrine of election, he also set in motion a revision of elements of his teaching on the God-world relation especially, which would have consequences not only for his doctrine of the Trinity, but also for his treatment of the being and attributes of God in Church Dogmatics 2.1. I will treat the latter in the final lecture tomorrow. 
Here in this lecture, I want to reconstruct Barth's doctrine of the Trinity just a bit by means of some additions necessitated by his doctrine of election and his later Christology found in volume four of his dogmatics. So in the second section of this lecture, I will treat election and Barth's later Christology and then turn in a third section to the task of reconstruction in which I will finally deliver on the promise made at the end of my last lecture to say nothing about the being of the triune God which does not find its ground in Christology. First then, the basic model. The heading of this first major section is the basic structure of Barth's doctrine of the Trinity. <clears throat> what is called Barth's doctrine of the Trinity by most Barth scholars is based entirely upon his treatise on that subject in Church Dogmatics 1.1. The exposition of the doctrine set forth in that treatise is heavily influenced by the manual Thomism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And if, if in fact, it, and in fact, excuse me, it has all the strengths and weaknesses of that particular version of Thomas's doctrine. First, the basic structure, which can be simply expressed. The Trinity is for Bart an eternal repetition of the one divine subject in pre-temporal eternity. One subject three times, and three times not successively, but in an eternal simultaneity. That Bart chose to replace the language of persons with the circumlocution modes of being has given rise over the years to a great deal of consternation on the part of those who think that modes of being is impersonal language, which cannot do justice to a personal God. Colin Gunton went so far as to suggest that modes of being cannot be worshiped. But we have to remember that God is fully himself for Bart, that is, the one divine personal subject in all of his modes of being. Therefore, God is a personal God, a God with one mind, will, will and energy of operation in all of his modes. Bart's preference for modes of being had to do with the fact that in modern times, the addition of the element of self-consciousness to the concept of the person had strengthened the temptation to find in the three persons three centers of consciousness, and with that, three minds, wills, etc. Bart was very aware that this had not been the intention of the Orthodox fathers of, late, of the late fourth and early fifth centuries, and that, in fact, they themselves had chosen to employ the term persons only because they could think of no good alternative. Both Basil the Great and Augustine made abundantly clear that they did not have any idea how the three could be distinguished beyond gesturing towards their differing modes of generation, which did not really define, any, define anything. Quid trace? What are the three? asked Augustine. And his answer was basically, heck if I know. In any event, talk of three persons by the Orthodox Fathers must not be taken literally since they themselves did not do so. Often missed in Barth's explanation of the basic structure of his doctrine of the Trinity is his claim that, quote, if the modes of revelation are really different from the modes of origination, and if the modes of origination are the real being of God, then this means that God in his revelation is not really God, unquote. Barth's target in this passage is modalism, which is a term he uses rather expansively to describe any view which reduces the divine modes of being to mere modes of appearance, which to his way of thinking is any model which would distinguish the imminent trinity from the economic trinity with regard to their content. Whether Bart is right to expand the definition of modalism, the modalism opposed by the early church in this way or not, his intention is quite clear. In his view, and I quote, Statements about the divine modes of being antecedently in themselves cannot be different in content from those that are made about their reality in Revelation. Now that's, that's Bart's form of Rahner's rule. Rahner came up with this later, okay? The imminent trinity is the economic trinity, vice versa. Rahner's version of it is much too formal, which is probably why it's susceptible to attack. Bart's is much more material. Listen to this again. 
Statements about the divine modes of being antecedently in themselves cannot be different in content from those that are to be made about their reality in Revelation. Unquote. Bart calls this his basic rule of reflection on the Trinity. And what it amounts to is what I said at the end of the last lecture, namely, that nothing should be said about the Trinity that does not find its ground in the economy. But that then also means that there can be no analogical gap between the economic and imminent trinity. The modes of revelation must be identical in content with the modes of origination if God is to be God in his self-revelation. And that has to mean in turn, since the revealed unity is a unity of operation ad extra, that the unity of God's being in and for himself cannot be a unity abstracted from that operation. God is already in himself for us. That is the underlying current in Bart's thought, even at this relatively early stage. And it would eventually mean that he could no longer speak of the one divine I in terms of a substance, which is replicated in each mode of being without respect for the economy. This, talk of substance, is the abstractive thinking of metaphysics. And it had already been rendered obsolete, even as Bart continued to employ it for a brief period of time in order to think provisionally with and alongside of the Orthodox Fathers. It would also mean that the affirmation of the concept of perichoresis, which appears in this part volume, is also consigned to the realm of metaphysical expression. A mutual indwelling of persons is hard to imagine, apart from a firm commitment to substance metaphysics. What the term perichoresis does do well, which cannot under any circumstances be surrendered, is to remind us that God is fully himself in each of his modes of being. But all that is really necessary to say that much is that the triune God is an eternal repetition in eternity. To add to this, talk of a communion of being can easily beget a host of misunderstandings. And for this reason, I think, a Bardian doctrine of the Trinity today should probably let the concept of perichoresis go the way of the concept of person, which is to say, we should dispense with it. Bart's model makes this concept, makes the concept of eternal generation to be basic to the differentiation of the modes of being. In this, he is no different from the Cappadocian Fathers or Augustine, who also made modes of origination to be the only possible answer to give to the question as to how the three are different. I think myself that it is a very good thing that Bart retained eternal generation. As I suggested in my opening lecture, the eternal begetting of the Son and the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit are the two biblical roots of the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. In their absence, the Orthodox doctrine would lose its moorings in Scripture altogether. Millard Erickson's claim that the concept of eternal generation does not have biblical warrant and does not make sense philosophically is wrong on both counts. When the Orthodox Church Fathers declared the Son to be begotten, not made, they knew exactly what they were saying. They were saying first, that the begetting in question is purely spiritual in nature, or we might say immaterial, which was their way of opposing that version of modalism, which suggested that the Father quite literally became, in the sense of was transformed into, the man Jesus. They understood clearly that this would turn the incarnation of God into a mere theophany. In the second place, they insisted that the begetting in question knows of no beginning. It is an eternal activity that is proper or essential to God. And third, and most importantly, the begetting of the Son does not make him other than the Father in the sense of an individual who stands over against the Father. The Son is also not other in a second sense. Namely, he is the same essentially. All that the Father has, which is to say, all that is proper to him as a God, he gives to the Son without reservation. That, it seems to me, is the orthodox doctrine, and for my money, it is completely coherent and intelligible. Mind you, I have my own questions about it, but they're not the questions of Millard Erickson and Paul Helm. Erickson follows Paul Helm uh, in suggesting that generation can only mean causation which, Helm suggests, gives rise necessarily to a, quote, asymmetry between the being and agency of the Father who begets, 
and the being an agency of the Son who is begotten, unquote. The mistake here lies in applying the language of causation much too literally, with the consequence that the distinction between the two terms in the affirmation begotten, not made, is rendered unclear. In truth, the distinction was always quite clear. The begetting of the Son does not give rise to an other over against the Father, as his activity in creation would do when the creation stands over against the Father and the Son. The Orthodox Fathers added that the Son remains in the Father even as he goes forth. Even though I think we can do without the idea of perichoresis today, it has to be said that the conceptual scheme employed here makes complete sense as it stands. I say this in response to the functional subordinationists in the evangelical camp. In any event, the structure of Bart's model should be clear. God is, for Bart, an eternal repetition in eternity, a single divine subject three times in eternal simultaneity. The final thing to be said is that father and son language is employed analogically. It, cannot, it could hardly be otherwise if the triune God is one subject in three modes of being. That these are proper names in the sense that God give, uses them to name himself is also quite true, but the content of these names has to be defined by what God reveals himself to be, not by a correlation to, to human fathers and sons. Analogical thinking in Bart's case always begins with the self-defining God, the self-naming God, and moves from there to the human and never the reverse. Now, Bart would always affirm this basic model of the Trinity, this basic structure. His preference for modes of being over persons is repeated in Church Dogmatics 4.1. He would eventually replace the rhetoric of eternal generation with the Hegelian language of self-positing and self-posited as descriptions of the one divine subject in his first two modes of being. But when he did, this meant no departure from the three theological values which I just identified as coming to expression in the orthodox understanding of eternal generation. All three are upheld, including the protest against understanding the son as the father's other in the sense of a distinct individual. According to Bart, God, quote, brings himself forth and in two distinctive ways he is brought forth by himself, unquote. This protest also marked the limit of how far Bart could travel with Hegel. Hegel is, in truth, the real father of the social trinitarianism that I described in my opening lecture, insofar as he made the son to be the man Jesus, full stop, and the spirit to be the church. But Bart departs from this in two fundamental ways. First, Hegel makes the becoming of God to be historical without remainder while the becoming of God for Bart is already complete in protology. And second, Bart does not directly identify the Son with the man Jesus as such, and he most certainly does not directly identify the Holy Spirit with the church. Let me just say, in concluding this section of my lecture, that although I think Richard Baucom and Larry Hurtado are right to say that Jesus is included in the identity of Yahweh, an eternal state of affairs made known by the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus to the right hand of God, I think myself that Bart's model is far more congruent with what I take to be the biblical justification for using this rhetoric than is the Moltmannian social trinitarianism preferred by Bauckham himself. On my lips, at least, the phrase, Bauckham's phrase, quote, included in the identity of, unquote, means not becoming a second divine individual. If that were not the case, then worship of Jesus would not be the worship of Yahweh, but the worship of a second alongside of him. You will have guessed, <clears throat> have discerned that I do stand very close to these guys, though. The early high Christology crowd is my crowd. They actually uh, formed a club and they produced coffee mugs that you can put on your mantle. And when I found out about this, I approached Larry and said, you wouldn't happen to have one of those left, would you? And he said, I do. 
And he gave it to me. So I now have, proudly have it on my mantle. All right, section two, election and Christology. Election is an eternal act of God in which he turns towards this world in grace and mercy. That this turning towards contains in itself the work of creation should go without saying, since there can be no gracious redemption in the absence of creation. Indeed, I would say without hesitation that creation exists for the sake of redemption and has no independent significance. Now, that's basically the meaning of the word superlapsarian. Superlapsarianism in all of its forms will say creation exists for the sake of redemption and has no independent significance. What I want to suggest in this section of my lecture is that if the epistemic root of our doctrine of God lies in the economy of God's redemptive activity in Christ, then the furthest back we can go is the eternal act of election. If God had another way of being prior to the act of election, we could not possibly know it. That means not only that we could not know the content of this prior state of being, we could not know that there was such a state at all. Not on the basis of the divine economy attested in Holy Scripture, we couldn't. It is only on a basis laid elsewhere, only on the basis of some form of natural theology or another that we could convince ourselves that God once had this other, perhaps higher, state of being and that we could authorize ourselves either to speculate about it or, in turn, to forbid speculation with the solemn invocation of the divine ineffability. But there is more to be said here, much more. For if God makes himself known as he truly is in himself in the history of Jesus of Nazareth, if what is given to be known in God's self-revelation in time is what God is essentially, then there is no state of being in God prior to electing. That election is eternal means, among other things, that no before and after interpretive scheme may legitimately be imposed upon it. God has his eternal being precisely in the eternal act of his electing of grace and mercy. To put it this way is to suggest that the being of God in the eternal act of election is the ontological ground of the Christology that I laid out in my last lecture, and that the Christology I laid out in my last lecture is the epistemic ground of the being of God in the eternal act of election. And if there is nothing in back of this eternal act, then God's eternal act of self-constitution as triune and his eternal act of turning towards the world in electing grace is one and the same eternal act. There are not two eternal acts, two acts in pretemporal eternity, one allegedly necessary and one allegedly free. There's just the one eternal act in which God constitutes himself as triune for the sake of being for us. To divide eternity into a before and after structure, as inevitably happens when we speak of self-constitution as necessary and election as free, is not only to invite the misunderstanding that divine freedom is voluntaristic or libertarian in nature, it is also to employ the word necessity in the sense which is given to that word whenever its meaning is established through opposition to contingent events in time. I will return to my own positive reconstruction of freedom and necessity in the final lecture. Suffice it to say here that the process of reflection which leads theologians to posit the kind of necessity and the kind of freedom which is presupposed in the two-act structure of thought is a process which is possible only on the basis of natural theology. But if we are going to construct our doctrine of God consistently on the basis of Christology, which is to say on the basis of the narrated history of Jesus of Nazareth as attested in Holy Scripture, then the meaning of those words, freedom and necessity, must be controlled by the one eternal event in which, as Barth puts it, God brings himself forth and in two distinctive ways is brought forth by himself in order to be God for us. The adequacy of the definitions offered will have to be measured by the one eternal event that God simply is. Now, I would submit 
that these moves are authorized by the content which Karl Barth gave to the divine election in the massive revision to which he subjected that doctrine in Church Dogmatics 2.2. This is not at all to say that Barth was always consistent with the theological program I'm sketching here. He wasn't, not in 2.2 or even later in his treatment of reconciliation in volume four. But he did attain to a greater and greater degree of consistency as time passed. This is a disputed point, obviously. Above all, in the English-speaking world, where the pressure to be nice seen is so great at the moment. But it is a reading of Bart which has a solid pedigree in the German literature. I have sketched this pedigree in great detail elsewhere and do not see, the need, see a need to repeat myself here. Suffice it to say that my reading of Bart is anticipated in important ways by Eberhard Jungel, Wilfried Herle, Hans Theodor Goebel, and Thies Guntlach in Germany, and by Rowan Williams and Paul Collins in the UK. That is not to say that any of these commentators on Bart's theology would endorse everything I say, or that I endorse everything any one of them says. It is also my view that there is no one right way to read Bart on this set of questions. So let's begin with what we can say with a good deal of certainty. For Bart, Jesus Christ is both the subject and the object of election. That he is the primary object of election is of tremendous significance. It means that he is chosen, that he has chosen reprobation for himself in order that all others might be elect in him. Like Calvin, Bart believes in a double predestination. But for him, election and reprobation are not made to stand in an eternal dualism over against each other. God chooses judgment, wrath, and condemnation for himself in the cross of Jesus Christ in order to take the penalty for sin away from the rest of us. In his second mode of being, he takes death into his own life and destroys it. Thus, reprobation serves the ends established in election. That is what it means to say that Jesus Christ is the object of election. But what can it possibly mean to say that Jesus Christ is the subject of election? Bart never really provides an answer to this question, in spite of the fact that readers were bound to wonder, perhaps because he thought that the answer was so obvious that it required no discussion. And up to a point, it is. If the triune God is, in fact, one subject in his three modes of being, then God is fully himself, that is to say, the one divine subject, in all three of his modes of being. He is himself as the one who brings himself forth from himself, and he is himself as the one who is brought forth. So if one were to object, but how can Jesus Christ possibly be the result of a divine decision and act if he himself is the cause of it? The answer is that the one divine subject is himself in both modes of being. Moreover, in his second mode of being, as Jesus Christ, the one divine subject wills what the Father wills. And so Jesus Christ is the subject of election. Thus far, I do not believe I have added anything to what Bart has at least implicitly affirmed himself. But I also think that we need to say more. I think myself that the willing of the Father is itself generative. That is to say, the command of the Father of which Bart speaks in the way of the Son into the far country in Church Dogmatics 4.1 generates the Son to be the mode of being in which the same divine subject obeys. That is what it ultimately means when I say that the event of divine self-constitution and the event of election are one and the same eternal event. Of course, talk of command and obedience has to be metaphorical insofar as we are speaking of modes of being of one divine subject. More realistically expressed, less more metaphorically, it is a divine self-humiliation which takes place in this event, a self-humiliation which is made possible and necessary by the generation of the Son. In any event, Bart clearly says that humility and obedience 
are not merely temporal. They are, in fact, proper to the eternal being of God as Son in relation to his Father. They are what Thomas would have called personal properties of the Son. Consider the following statements, and I'm quoting from Church Dogmatics 4.1. Quote, For God, it is just as natural to be lowly as to be high, to be near as to be far, to be abroad as to be home. The humility in which he dwells and acts in Jesus Christ is not alien to him, but proper to him. His humility is a novum mysterium for us in whose favor he executes it when he makes use of his freedom for it. But for him, this humility is no novum mysterium, unquote. And, quote, if the humility of Jesus Christ is not simply an attitude of the man Jesus of Nazareth. If it is the attitude of this man because according to the atonement that takes place in this man, there is a humility grounded in the being of God, then something else is grounded in the being of God himself. For according to the New Testament, it is the case that the humility of this man is an act of obedience. If then God is in Christ, if what the man Jesus does is God's own work, this aspect of self-emptying and self-humbling of Jesus Christ as an act of obedience cannot be alien to the being of God." Unquote. And so Bart concludes, and again I quote, we have not only not to deny, but actually to affirm and understand as essential to the being of God the offensive fact that there is in God himself and above and a below, a prius and a posterius, a superiority and a subordination." Unquote. Now again, Bart is not affirming the subordination of one divine subject to another divine subject, as is the case with evangelical subordinationists. The entire discussion of internal subordination is metaphorically intended, since what we have in view here is the act of a single subject in differing modes of being. But there is an eternal subordination, nonetheless, an eternal self-humiliation on the part of the one divine subject which is constitutive of his second mode of being. But that then also means that there is no logos as such, no logos in and for himself. And in and for himself, which lacks the determination for incarnation, is simply a myth. But here I must immediately add, to say this much is not to reject the concept of a logos asarkos. The logos is united to a human person in time, and in fact, late in time, as Charles Wesley so nicely put it. And he does not bring his humanity with him into this world. He does not bring his body down from heaven. The man Jesus is conceived by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin precisely for the union or better, to borrow I.A. Dorner's phrase, for this uniting. So yes, the Logos is a sarkos before he is made by the Holy Spirit to be en sarkos. Moreover, one cannot erase the concept of a Logos a sarkos without completely collapsing God into the history of the man Jesus, without erasing the creator-creature distinction, without surrendering the otherness of God from the world. I mention all of this because I have, on a number of occasions, been accused of rejecting the concept of a logos asarkos, most recently by Stephen Long in his essay in Proecclesia in April of this year. But that is a charge that is completely without foundation. I have, from the beginning of the debate, which has swirled around my reading of Karl Barth's theology, quite explicitly affirmed the existence of a logos asarkos. But I have done so, please note, in the form of a Logos incarnandus, by which I mean the Logos who is eternally determined for incarnation, but who has yet to be united to the man Jesus in the womb of the Virgin. Thus, the issue for me has never been whether, prior to incarnation, there is such a thing as the Logos asarkos. The issue has always had to do with his identity. What I have suggested is that his identity in eternity and his identity in time are the same, Jesus Christ, in accordance with Barth's version of Rahner's rule. 
What I have suggested is that his identity and eternity and his eternity in time are the same. And I say this not to erase the otherness of God from creation, but precisely in order to protect the real and genuine otherness of God from the metaphysical projection of an identity which has never been his, which has never been real. My point is this. The word of the Father as eternally generated has a determination for incarnation. That is his identity. That is the distinguishing property, the personal property of God's second mode of being. I'll have more to say about this in a moment. Let me round out this discussion of election and Christology by saying that the reason an historicized Christology of the kind I set forth in my last lecture can be the epistemic root of the being of God in the eternal event in which he constitutes himself as God is that Jesus' history of perfect obedience to the will of his Father in time perfectly corresponds to, and to the eternal obedience of the Son to the Father. Perfectly corresponds. What we catch sight of in this statement is the correspondence of God with God, of the being of God in time with the being of God in eternity, of a double structure, to borrow Jungel's phrase, of the eternal history, which is the self-constitution of the electing God, and the history of Jesus, from cradle to grave to resurrection and ascension. Thus, the obedience of Jesus is the concrete realization in time of the obedience of the Son in eternity, and the obedience of the Son in eternity is his ontological identification with the obedience of Jesus in time. I will further explicate the significance of these claims in relation to the differentiation of divine persons in just a moment. Now, my concern throughout this discussion we just engaged in of election and Christology has been to ward off the charge that I reject the Logos of Sarkos, and that I think I've done successfully. There can be no distinction between eternity and time, no distinction between the Logos Incarnandus and the Logos Incarnatus without an affirmation of the Logos of Sarkos. But I also need to distance myself a bit from a certain misunderstanding which has on occasion been found amongst my friends and allies. I do not believe myself that the history of Jesus as such is constitutive of the eternal being of God. I have been careful to say that the history of Jesus is the concrete realization of the eternal history of God in his second mode of being, and not that Jesus' history constitutes God as God. God is eternal. He constitutes himself as God in the pre-temporal event of election. He does not constitute himself as God in the historical realization of his eternal act of will, but in his eternal self-constitution for that historical realization. He is already in protology what he will become in time. And so I could not agree with Paul Dafid Jones when he speaks of a transformation of God's being in the incarnation. Nor could I agree with those post-Bardians who make the resurrection the moment in which Jesus Christ is made to be God. I think that has more to do with Ponadbear than it does with Bard. <coughs> I'm thinking here especially Francis Watson and his engagement with Jimmy Dunn on the question of the significance of the resurrection for the being of God. For me, Jesus Christ is the electing God, and therefore he is God in protology. Everhart Jungel put it best, the triune God, Jungel says, has his being in becoming, but the triune God does not become. God does not undergo change on the level of his being when in Jesus Christ, in his second mode of being, he lives a human life, suffers, dies, and is raised from the dead. That is what is contained in the eternal becoming that is the divine procession. Put another way, the eternal processions contain the temporal missions, but the former must never be reduced to the latter. If that were to happen, then what we would have before us is a mutable God, a God who becomes the God of process theology. And that is something I could never agree to, since for me, immutability is most definitely a biblical descriptor of God's being. And then third and finally, final steps in reconstructing the doctrine of the imminent trinity. 
Up to this point, I have been arguing that the eternal processions contain the temporal missions in themselves as their end. This is not, I should add, a move which is entirely without precedent. If Matthew Levering is right, Thomas Aquinas, too, understood there to be a single eternal event in which God is God, an event, Levering says, with two terms. Quoting Levering, in this one act, which is necessary with respect to God's being and free with respect to creaturely being, God wills both himself to be and other things to be, but himself as the end and other things as ordained to that end, unquote. And so for Thomas, according to Levering, quote, the relationship to the creature is not absent from, divine, from the divine processions. It's not absent from the divine processions, although it is secondary because of the twofold term of the procession in which the eternal term has priority, unquote. Now, in Levering's description of Thomas's doctrine, the words necessary and free are retained, though not defined. So some semblance of the view I have been criticizing is retained by Levering. But it is a single event Levering is talking about. And it is an event which has two terms, both God and the human. But the most important point here is that for Levering's Thomas too, the processions contain the missions. To be sure, what I have done with this idea goes well beyond what Thomas would be comfortable in saying. Thomas wishes simply to say that essence and existence are one in God. That is why he finally has but a single divine act in eternity. I want to say that essence and existence are one too, but I want to say more than that. I want to define the meaning of words like necessity and freedom by the standard of the eternal activity that God is. And most importantly, I want to be able to resolve a problem that the Cappadocians, Augustine, and Thomas were never able to resolve. I want to be able to differentiate the divine persons or modes of being by means of something more than modes of origination. That, by the way, is the grain of truth in social Trinitarianism. Social Trinitarians recognize that modes of origination add nothing to the definition of a person or thing. To define the divine persons in distinction from one another in terms of modes of origination says nothing at the end of the day. And saying nothing can be quite tempting because it allows one to maintain the full equality of the essence of the three undisturbed by difference. But saying nothing also means that the bridge which holds together the various bits of which the classical doctrine of the Trinity is composed is finally silence. And it never was a fully coherent doctrine. It's all very well to fall silent when the divine mystery requires one to do so, but it is surely arbitrary to invoke silence only at the point at which one has painted himself into a corner. When the source of the problem lies in the in the impossible attempt to combine a metaphysical concept of oneness with a biblical attestation of difference. What I have been suggesting is that the divine processions contain the temporal missions as their end. An end is a somewhat different, is somewhat different than a term, which is Thomas's preferred word, since end suggests a purposive activity directed towards that which is not God. But this move does allow me to give greater content to the differentiation of the divine modes of being than does the reduction of modes of being to modes of origination. Please note that it is the modes of being I'm seeking to differentiate here, not three subjects. I'm not a social Trinitarian. I have already anticipated my description of what classically has been called the personal property of the sun that property which is unique to him rather than common to the three. The personal property of the Son is, as Bart says, that he is eternally generated for humility and obedience. What I have done here is simply to build upon the classical emphasis upon modes of origination by making eternal generation a purposive activity. What the New Testament calls the Son of God is that mode of being in God in which the divine subject is characterized by humility and obedience. 
What then of the Holy Spirit? What is the personal property by means of which he is made to be different from father and son? Augustine rather famously made the spirit to be the bond of love between father and son. And though he was much criticized for this in the 20th century, I think he was right. Certainly Bart too affirmed that much. But I think we can and should say more. I would like to propose that we understand the Holy Spirit as the power by means of which father and son act ad extra. In a single eternal event, the Father commands, the Son obeys, and the Spirit proceeds from both to be the power by means of which son, the Son acts in creation and redemption. To put it this way suggests that the Son acts eternally in the power of the Spirit as well, which secures the identity in content of the Lagos Incarnandus and the Lagos Incarnatus. The Son never acts directly. He is not the effective agent of creation, for example. The spirit of the Son is the effective agent of creation. So even in, the, in eternity, the Son acts through the spirit, in reliance upon the spirit. That is what I mean when I say that the Lagos Incarnandus is already characterized by humility and obedience. John Owens want, Owen once said, and I quote, the only singular immediate act of the person of the Son on his human nature was the assumption of it into subsistence with himself." Unquote. I think Owen is almost right. In my view, the Son never acts immediately upon or through his human nature, but always and only in the power of the Holy Spirit. That, I think, is the best way to understand the significance of conceived by the Holy Ghost. And what then is the Father's personal property? The Father's personal property, too, is defined by the eternal act in which he has his being as Father. The Father is the origin, the mode of being in the one divine subject, in which the end to which the one eternal act is directed and contained and given. As such, the Father is also the guarantee of identity with himself in his mode of being as Son and as Spirit. The mode of being in which we recognize the triune God as majestic, high, lifted up, superior, is his mode of being as Father. Let me just pause for a moment to ask what the effect of this understanding of personal properties might be on the received orthodoxy. Traditionally, common properties were defined as belonging to the shared divine essence, substantially conceived. And even if one took the step of insisting, and Thomas certainly did this, that the essence is not a fourth something behind or beneath the persons, the divine essence still had a certain logical priority insofar as common properties were given a fixed and definite content, whereas the personal properties were simply, as Thomas put it, subsisting relations. Divine persons subsist in the one divine essence, so persons functions for Thomas on a secondary level of reflection. What I'm doing here is to make persons, understood, mind you, as modes of being, central to the discussion. There's nothing behind or beneath election, no pre-existing subject who is first one way and then makes himself triune. And so, in my view, it is better to think of common properties as a description of the personal properties taken together. What God is essentially is triunity. His essence is not to be found in a substance in which persons subsist. God is subject, not substance. He is the subject of the threefold eternal act which he is. And therefore, common properties describe the one eternal act from the standpoint of its results, not from the standpoint of a presupposition substantially conceived. What happens on this view to the eternal equality of persons? Well, you have to remember that the one divine subject is himself in all three of his modes of being. If what God is essentially is the triune God, and if the common properties of the triune God are all the personal properties taken together, then the triune God remains omnipotent even when, in his mode of being as son, he expresses his power and weakness. If you want more than this, 
if you want the kind of equality that is grounded in a shared substance and which necessarily excludes definable difference, then you are thinking about God on some other basis than Christology. The equality of the three must be affirmed, certainly, but the definition assigned to that word must be controlled by the eternal act that God is. But I should also point out that the ancient principle of inseparable operations is also preserved on this view. The Father acts through the Son and the power of the Spirit, and that is true of all the works of the triune God and extra. I'm almost done. I want to conclude my treatment of the doctrine of the imminent trinity by addressing a challenge which has been brought against it. In a 2009 essay by Bruce Marshall, the attempt is made to get me to choose between two alternative consequences of my basic move of making election to be the eternal event in which God is God. Either, Marshall says, such a move makes the identity of the divine persons to be as contingent as the events on which their identity depends, which means that their identity could have been otherwise or that God might not even have been trying. Or, he suggests, I recoil in horror from such a possibility and insist that the temporal events on which the identity of the triune God depends are themselves necessary, which, he says, would mean that the command of the Father and the obedience of the Son are necessary acts and could not have been otherwise. In truth, Marshall's either-or presupposes the validity of the very metaphysics which I have caused, called in question in order to give definition to key terms like contingent and necessary. I do not believe that Marshall himself realizes just how fundamental the challenge I have issued is. He is, in fact, presupposing as valid what I have called into question without arguing for it in order to get his critique up and running. I'm going to treat Marshall's scheme in greater detail in my final lecture, and here I wish simply to say that the objection which Marshall brings against my proposal is hardly fatal, as the French Dominican Emmanuel Durand has claimed. Not fatal either for my constructive proposal or for my reading of Bart, which is Durand's special interest. Here I wish only to address what Marshall believes to be the baleful consequence of the first alternative. And I'm treating this here because I hear again and again that I'm a nominalist when actually I'm at the opposite end of that spectrum. So I may as well cl uh, clarify that. Marshall argues that if the identity of the divine persons is dependent, now notice this is his word, not mine, on events which themselves are contingent, by which he means that they might not have taken place at all or might have turned out differently, then it follows, he says, that the identity of the persons are equally contingent. In making this argument, Marshall assumes, and again without argument, that election is a, quote, free decision of God which could have been otherwise, unquote. Embedded in this assumption is a voluntaristic definition of divine freedom, which I have also called into question. But let's stay with Marshall just a little longer. Marshall then says that if I make the identities of the divine persons contingent on a, quote, free divine decision, I wind up with no answer to the question, quote, who or what makes this decision? God, presumably, Marshall says, but not God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. These three are the contingent outcome of God's decision about who or what he will be, and so cannot, individually or jointly, be the ones who make it. As a result, who or what it is that makes the decision to be the trinity for us is, the, is truly the unknown God. On this scenario, who or what God is in himself, what the proto-God who decides to present himself to us as the trinity is really like, we cannot begin to say, unquote. What shall I say in response to Marshall? Three things. First, I in no way make the identity of the divine persons to be dependent on contingent events. The self-determination of God in pretemporal eternity is not dependent upon anything that is not God. It is an act of sovereign power and authority. And in any case, God's foreknowledge is exhaustive. God knows with certainty the outcome of all contingent events. There's no real risk to him contained in the determination to be God in this way. 
which also means that he's not dependent upon the foreseen events for his being as God. Second, Marshall's on slightly more solid ground when he suggests that I make the identities of the divine persons contingent upon a free divine decision. Now, the first statement was upon contingent events as foreseen. Here, in his second version of the criticism, he says, I make the identities of the divine persons contingent upon a free divine decision. But since I do not understand this free divine decision as a choice amongst options, I cannot and will not concede his assumed definition of divine freedom. I will return to the nature of divine freedom in my final lecture, and I'm not going to say any more about it here. But then we come thirdly to the suggestion that the divine subject is made by me to be unknown and unknowable. This is not a new suggestion. Others have made it, Van Driel, for example, though rarely with Marshall's rhetorical and argumentative skill. The problem is that the critique simply doesn't hold. There is for me nothing behind election, no proto-God, no state of being in God, which is above and prior to the one eternal event that is the life act of the triune God. In this eternal pre-temporal event, God simply is Father, Son, and Spirit, and that's all that can be said about it. Durand thinks this objection to be fatal to my reading of Karl Barth because, he says, Barth's concern both early and late was that God should be fully God in his self-revelation. He's certainly right about that. That is, in fact, the concern which I myself identified as the red thread that runs through the whole of Barth's theological development in my book on that subject. To Durand, however, I would like to say more than simply, my proposal does not posit, nor does it require me to posit, the existence of an unknown God behind eternal election. I would like to say more firmly, in fact, that what is truly fatal to Barth's understanding of divine self-revelation is the attempt to wed it to metaphysics. It is metaphysics, after all, which has always given rise to the apophatic approach, which makes the highest wisdom to consist in the profession of divine ineffability. It is precisely in an, in an effort to close the door on any and every putatively higher state of being than that which is made known in Christ as the, etern as the eternal election that I have, than that which is made known in Christ that I have advanced my critique of metaphysics. In fact, I would say, to go any other way than the way I have actually gone would be fatal to Barth's mature Christocentric theology. Now, at this point, of course, a new chorus of objections will immediately ensue. According to Marshall, my only alternative now will have to be to make creation and redemption necessary to God. And he concludes, if this is the case, then grace is no longer grace, Romans 11:6. The saving acts of God can no longer be grace and gift. I will have a full and complete answer to this new objection in my final lecture. I will simply say for now that I don't accept his definition of necessity, since his definition of necessity is constructed in polar opposition to voluntaristic freedom. Conclusion, just how Nicene is my reconstruction. In my second lecture, I made mention of the fact that the Nicene Creed is actually quite minimalist in its affirmations. I would like to explain what I meant more fully by way of conclusion. What does affirmation of a creed require of us? Well, certainly it requires us to affirm that the Son is begotten and not made. In other words, the Son's not a creature. He is both truly and fully God. The target here is Arianism, and that bears comment. There are basically three closely coordinated elements to what the church condemned under the name Arianism. Arius himself was motivated to take the steps he did by his commitment to divine impassibility. What he called the high God could alone be impassable in his view. The agent of creation could not. Arius probably believed, secondly, that there was when the sun was not. Certainly that view was anathematized at the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which suggests that someone had said it, and it may well have been Arius. And third, it follows that the Son is a different subject than the Father. 
Now, it should be quite clear by now that I do not have any of these area and tendencies. I reject impassibility. I reject the claim that there was when the sun was not. And I most certainly do not make father and son to be differing subjects. Some have actually said to me, well, that may well be. You're not historically Aryan, but you're still logically Aryan. Where this is said, the meaning of the word Aryan is undergoing a considerable expansion, usually by being made a type, as in a typology. But then, of course, what is being discussed is no longer what the church has universally condemned under that name. I will simply say that those who operate in this way are functioning as free-thinking theologians and not as church theologians. There's nothing ecclesial in such judgments. The creed also says that the Son is light from light, true God from true God. Clearly, I affirm this, and I do so in an orthodox sense. The Son is eternally generated, and generation is immaterial in nature. Moreover, I do not make the mistake of the modalists in failing adequately to distinguish the persons of Father and Son. In fact, I have just given more content to their differentiation than did Basil, Augustine, and Thomas. Nor do I make the second modalist mistake of making the Son to be a temporary manifestation of the Father, a theophany, in other words. I reject patropassianism. In fact, I would go so far as to say with Karl Rahner that only the Son could have been incarnate. Only he could suffer and die because the eternal determination to do so is what gives him a unique identity as, as a person in the Godhead. The creed affirms that all things are made through the Son. Obviously, I don't have any problems with that affirmation either. We are left then with one controversial item found in the creed, namely the term homoousios. In all honesty, I can say with Calvin, that would not have been my preferred term. What it seeks to bring to expression, in my view, is the Son's equality with the Father. It comes at the very end of a series of clauses which describe the generation of the Son. In this way, it refers to the resultant being of the Son. The Son is of one substance with the Father. I do not think myself that anything more than equality is intended by this phrase, and I've already defended myself on that score. The Father acts through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. One and the same subject is the Father who initiates, the Son who receives, and the Spirit who acts outwardly, and is all three simultaneously. The word orthodoxy means right doctrine. People may disagree with regard to what constitutes right doctrine, but only a fool would set out to be wrong. I obviously think that what I've said in this lecture is orthodox. What must finally decide this, however, is Holy Scripture. I care very much about being in line with Nicaea. I think what I've said here is Nicene in spirit, if not in every detail. But at the end of the day, I'm more interested in what biblical scholars might have to say about my proposal than I am in what historians of doctrine and systematic theologians might say. For scripture is the material norm in any Protestant theology worthy of the name. Thank you. That was one of my shorter ones. Is there a cereal in the house? <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps an exergy? I'm a leader of those two options, by the way. But, uh, yeah, um, Bruce, in, in one of your uh, statements, you. Uh, so you, you were critical of the, or you, you made a critical comment concerning the idea that then when the son took on uh, assumed flesh, that there was a transformation yeah. of any kind. Yeah, Jones terminology, yeah. So relating that to, for instance, John 17, 5, um, would you be equally critical and propelled by the, by the same reasons for the glory that, that the Son expresses that he had before the foundation of the world to the glory that he anticipates in his exaltation 
as for, uh, in terms of those that would explain that as a transformation of glory. And how would you, or, or, or uh, following from that, how would you characterize that type of uh, comparative glory before the foundation of the world and then in his ex exaltated state? I, I don't think my proposal um, challenges traditional readings of that passage altogether. That is to say, what, what I did was, by reversing the ordering of personal properties and common properties, I did not eliminate the uh, importance of being able to say with John 17.5 that Jesus has a certain glory with the Father from the foundations of the world and that he will be known to have it in the future. Because the basic model makes that possible, the basic model of one subject and three modes of being guarantees that the glory of the triune God is the glory of the one subject and all three of his modes of being. So is it fair to say, or is it fair, is my understanding correct in your model that the glory of the ex exaltated, uh, the sun in his exaltation is a glory that's uh, uh, anticipated yes. in the same way that everything else is anticipated yes. in the sun? Yes, I love the word anticipation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Yes. Yeah, that's, the, that's finally the question of the extra Calvinisticum. And the way I handled that already in the 2000 essay that uh, kick-started all of this brouhaha was to say that the Lagos Asarkos um, and the Lagos Ensarkos is, how did I put it? The Lagos is both Asarkos and Ensarkos with regard to identity before and after. So, the Lagos is Asarkos and Ensarkos as Incarnandus and as Incarnatus. Now, he is so in, in differing ways, one by anticipation and one in concrete realization. But nonetheless, you have to continue to think of the Lagos as filling heaven and earth, even as he is locally circumscribed in the flesh of Jesus. So I want to I affirm and uphold uh, the reformed extra, because in large measure, I don't think it's reformed. I think it's just classical. I think you can find it in the fathers. And in relation to that, is the existence of the Lagos of Sarkos, is that merely eternal, or is that also temporal uh, as Jesus Christ is? When the Lagos assumes flesh, he doesn't cease to be eternal. You, the, the, the distinction between eternity and time is not erased. Anticipation seems to be doing a lot of work for you, actually, ontologically, <coughs> because the reason there's no change when the son takes on flesh is because he always was <coughs> anticipating to be this. Yeah. I'm reminded, in a sense, of what Pondenberg says about anticipation as well. Yeah. The being of God is what it is in anticipation of eschatology. But I think you would perhaps locate the eschatological moment not at the end of history, but in Jesus' history? I would locate it in protology, in election. I mean, the biggest difference between Pondenberg and myself um, is rooted finally in our differing conceptions of election. He doesn't have an election in protology. He subsumes it under ecclesiology, as I recall. It's been a while since I taught election. It's been two years ago. But I, I did extensive excavation of Pondenberg on that, and that's my recollection. Um, can I tell you a story about Pondenberg real quick? Uh, Pondenberg in this country is understood very widely as uh, a kind of antipode to Karl Barth. And uh, that, I don't think, was his own self-understanding. I think he was greatly disappointed when Barth reacted so vociferously to his own proposals because he understood them to be, at, initially, as extending Barth's thought uh, in significant ways. But at any rate, the story goes, I'm Friederike Neussel, who was Pondenberg's last graduate student told me the story. She's a professor of ecumenical theology and systematics in Heidelberg. And she told me that uh, one day a 
portrait appeared outside the door of the office of Trutz Rentorf. It was a portrait of Ernst Trelch. And it was obvious that Rentorf was saying, this is my guy. You know, this is the guy who has defined the direction I take in theology. And a week later, Pannenberg put up a picture outside of his door. It was a picture of Karl Barth. I've always found that to be very interesting. Dr. Pryor. Would it be permissible to make a comment and a question? Yeah, sure. The, the comment is I'm with you on the Protestant principle. Where yeah. I think I want to jump off the train is when you hand the Bible over to biblical scholars. That sounds to me more like it comes from 19th century Germany than from 16th century um, Protestant Reformation here. Yeah. So which biblical scholars, et cetera, is, is um, the point where I want to jump off the train there. My question has to do with whether you can hold your view of election in terms of its significance vis-a-vis -vis revelation um, and be other than supralapsarian. Mm. Could you be infralapsarian? Uh, and I'm wondering if you couldn't unless you held there would be an incarnation without the fall. Have I understood the logic? Say the right last there? part again. Could you, be, could you hold your view of election and be infralapsarian? Or would the only way to do that be to say, there would be uh, an incarnation even without the fall. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't believe for a second that uh, incarnation could have been without the fall. I think that's just, <laughs> there was, there was a, uh, a Saturday Night Live episode years ago in which Jesse Jackson was a game show host and the game was called The Question is Moot. And it didn't matter what the contestant said, Jackson would ring his bell and he'd say, the question is moot. <laughs> and this question is moot. As, as somebody who's inclined toward infralapsarianism and inclined to agree that that question is moot, mm -hmm. then that raises questions for me as to whether I can hold your view of election without changing to supralapsarian. No, you can't. You need to become a supralapsarian. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me return to your comment, though. Um, the problem with historical method is, 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 the, is the people who practice it. I mean, the very pra best practitioners of historical critical research in our day and age are actually evangelicals. What does that tell you? Well, the, the problem, when, when, when historical criticism goes awry, and we, we can think of any number of examples, it's not because of the method they're employing, it's because of certain dogmatic assumptions that the critic brings to the task which cannot themselves be justified by the historical method they're employing. The reality is, and I think you and I would certainly uh, agree on this, if you're going to try to interpret someone like Paul, then you'd probably be a lot better off if you shared his frame of assumptions rather than trying to impose a set of dogmatic assumptions that are alien to him upon him and then pretend that what you're doing is historical work. That's a long way of saying, although the early Karl Barth had a lot of nasty things to say about historicism, I think if he were alive today, he would probably say, and he, he did repeatedly say again and again that he wasn't interested in getting rid of historical criticism. He just wanted the historical critics to become more critical of themselves in their exercise of it. In fact, uh, Rudolf Smint, does his name, name mean anything to you? He was Professor uh, Gerdingen in Old Testament, I think wrote an essay for uh, Barth's Festschrift in 19, I want to say, might have been 66, the last one, on Barth's 80th birthday, birthday Parisia. Anyway, it's a famous essay called Nach Kritische Exegese, Post-Critical Exegesis. And that phrase has been picked up by a lot of people, right? Barth told him he didn't like it, because what he did was critical exegesis. But he wanted the critics to be more self-critical and stop imposing their dogmatics on historical work. And that, I think, is the right approach. So do I, do I endorse anything and everything that's done under that name? Heavens no. And I think I've already indicated who, who the people I am most sympathetic with in New Testament scholarship today. It has to do with the apocalyptic readers, uh, people like the Martin School. Um, I don't go with everything they say, but they're, I'm sympathetic with a good bit of it. And especially the early high Christology crowd. I think those guys are great. You'd probably go with the same people, I'm guessing. Yes, but probably with an amendment. 
Probably, probably what? Probably with an amendment. Yeah, what's that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm too much of a historian to look away from that. I'm not saying that's material, but it does seem to be the rest of the human is relevant context. It is. It is. I think you have to have a dialectical approach to these kinds of problems. A canonical reading of scripture which simply looks away from the particularities of an individual writer isn't healthy either. So there has to be a balance between the two. As dogmatic theological readers of, of the Bible, of the canon, we do have to read across a range of writers and a range of texts. That's quite true. But not at the sacrifice of their peculiarities. If you have a question, you're going to regret it if you don't come to the microphone right now. <laughs> Doug Sweeney. I have an honestly ignorant question. Um, yeah, I'm not a serial or an exegete. I'm what my teacher, Peter Hodgson, used to call a mere historian. <laughs> and I'm not an expert in Bard or in, or in McCormick. And I'm trying to <laughs> bend my mind around um, yeah. the ontological standing or significance of your use of uh, the language of personality with regard to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even as we discuss the imminent trinity. Yeah. Uh, and even though you want us to talk about modes of being more than you want us to talk about persons, and we don't uh, probably, you don't want us to maintain the language of perichoresis and so on. Yeah. So here's what I'm thinking. I mean, the main question is, what's the ontological standing of that language in your of personality? Yeah, the language of personality. And I'm thinking about the lecture last week from the New Testament. Right. Where you told us there was a lot of vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I, thou yeah. language, particularly in Johannine literature, but yeah. elsewhere too, uh, between Father, Son, Spirit. You know, Jesus prays to the Father. The Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. Yeah. Jesus is going to go uh, to the cross and to glory, but he promises he'll send this other, you know, in your theology, in your doctrine of the imminent trinity, yeah. what's the significance of that language? Help me understand you know, the ontological status of personal language as we think about the relations of Father, Son, and Spirit in the Godhead. If, if Lewis Ayers is right in his interpretation of the orthodox doctrine of the trinity as it, it finally emerges in the period between the, the, the early 360s and 381, that what we basically have before us is one mind, one will, one energy in the triune God that proceeds from the Father through the Son to the Holy Spirit. Then personality in modern terms should be ascribed not to the individual hypostases but to the subject. God is personal. The one divine subject is personal. So then how do you handle Jesus praying to the Father is the question. When my son was a little boy, he was about five years old, we were saying prayers one night. And uh, he looks up at me after prayer and he says, Daddy, Jesus is God, right? I said, yes, John, Jesus is God. He says, OK, so when he prays, is he talking to himself? And I said, John, this is going to be hard to understand, but I'm going to take a stab at this. Jesus is God but he's also human. And it's only because he is also human that he can pray without talking to himself. It's because the second person of the Trinity takes on human life that there is this vis-a-vis -vis that we see so conspicuously in the New Testament witness. Now, I'm trying to explain how that doesn't create a mutation in God. And I think I pulled it off. My question is along the same lines. Um, it's, it's really helpful, the idea that, um, that there's a command and an obedience or a command and a humility um, that, we, that we see in the economy yeah. as a ground in God's eternal being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but where it's hard for me to understand is when um, the, the single divine subject... Um, commands I, and obeys. 
I, I can, yeah, I can see, I can see what it looks like when I see the father command the son, the son obeys, and, but when I try to think back to the God in Himself, what does it mean for? Yeah. That's a very relational, very. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess how would you flesh that out in the divine being? As as you can tell, I've been resistant to treating command and obedience in literal terms. I want to understand it as a metaphorical description of what amounts to a, an eternal act of self-humiliation on the part of the one divine subject. And I would agree completely with Bart when he says that humility and obedience belong to, are proper to, the one divine subject. This is the meaning of the eternal repetition in eternity. But I don't, I resist going any further than that because if you do, you turn the hypostases into distinct individuals. And therefore, since Bart doesn't want to do that, and since the early church doesn't authorize it, um, I would prefer not to think of father and, son, father and Son, the Father commanding the Son obeying in literal terms, because then you need distinct individuals. And the hypostases are not individuals. I don't know if that helps. I mean, everybody's gesturing towards the mystery at some point. The trick in Christian theology is to be sure that the mystery of which you speak is truly the divine mystery and not the result of your prejudice or your cowardice or whatever else, you know? Your inconsistency, your, you know. So it's not that I eliminate mystery, it's just that I locate it in a different place than a lot of other people do. I'm going to ask one question, and then we'll have time for one more after that. We've been talking about the eternal recapitulation of the same. So I'm going to ask a question I asked earlier in the lectures. Repetition. Uh, it, yes, repetition okay. of the same. Um, it has to do with the revelation of God's glory to Moses in Exodus uh, 32. Yeah. And uh, what I'm curious about is, uh, God is the electing God in Israel. That's all in anticipation of what he's going to do in Christ, I suppose. Yep. But when he makes his glory known to Moses and identifies his ways as involving mercy and loving kindness yeah. and so on, was that a theophany or a revelation, Exodus 34 says? I think it's a theophany. I think the, the metaphorical language of Moses seeing God's hind parts um, is theophanic language. And it's interesting that when you, when you see Jesus, what you see is the face of God. Michael Wishelgrad was absolutely right to insist that the God of Israel has a Jewish face. The difference between me and him is he identifies it with Abraham, and I, as a Christian, identify it with Jesus. But I do think uh, when it says that, when, when the text says that God spoke to Moses, uh, face to face. I, I don't, I don't, I take that as metaphorical. I mean, it could mean if you tried it in a non metaphorical tr uh, direction, you'd have to be able to say on Christological grounds that it, God is speaking to Moses in Christ. And that is another possibility. But otherwise, it has to be theophany. Because Jesus is the face of God. I don't see anyone with the microphone, so going. Going, gone. So I hope you, so we come back tomorrow at 4 o'clock for the final lecture, lecture number seven. This was only amazing. Thank Dr. McCormick once more.